Humpty Doo Poltergeist. Humpty Doo is a small town in the Northern Territory of Australia, not far from Darwin. Humpty Doo is also an Australian slang term, which means everything is turned upside down or topsy-turvy. It's actually the perfect description for the sort of phenomena caused by a poltergeist. The following activity began in 1998 with classic behavior when the residents of 90 McMinns Drive, Andrew and Kirsty Agius, and their friends who were sitting out on the porch were plagued with a shower of pebbles. After moving indoors, the commotion continued with stones falling through the air from just below the ceiling all through the house on tables, floors, beds, and even their heads. The pebbles appeared to be from the owner's own driveway and felt warm when touched. Later that night, other objects began to appear from nowhere, small batteries, spanners, and most alarmingly, knives and shards of broken glass dropped and flew across the rooms. Over the next few days, the vandalism began. A CD player was flung onto the floor then glass cabinet doors and windows were smashed by a flying ashtray. Appliances were ripped off counters, mattresses were overturned, and the most sinister part was the scraping noises coming from inside the walls. Despite the intervention of three priests, the polt, as the residents like to call it, refused to be calmed. Creepiest of all were the words and symbols that began to materialise on the walls, written in marker pen or spelled out in scrabble tiles on the floor. Troy, skin, fire, car, and help were the first set of words to appear. This is chilling when you consider that their friend Troy had been burned to death in a car crash very near to the property just before the poltergeist activity began. After being terrorized for four long months by the polt, it left just as abruptly as it had arrived, and the event is still unexplained to this day. Mashio Hoshino's last photograph. Mashio was a wildlife photographer who was considered to be one of the most accomplished men in his field. Born in 1952 in Japan, he grew up with an interest in nature and began hiking and exploring his native country. Whilst at university, he came across a photograph of a small village in the Bering Sea named Shishmaref. Intrigued by the remoteness of the tiny snow-covered settlement and keen to know what life was like there, Michio wrote a letter to the mayor of the village. It took several months for a reply to arrive, but in the summer of 1973, Michio was invited to spend three months in Shishmaref, staying with a local family. Having studied photography back in Japan, Michio was soon recording everything he experienced on camera. He spent the next 18 years traveling all over the state of Alaska and photographing his extended stays in the wilderness. He was also a talented writer recording stories about the land and its peoples as he traveled. His photographs were widely published and lauded around the world. It was on one of his trips to photograph bears in Kamchatka, Russia in August 1996 that his life was tragically cut short. Michio and his team were able to track down a large brown bear near the shores of Kuril Lake. The bear was easy to photograph as it was not afraid of humans and continued to fish as they approached, allowing for close-up shots. It became clear from traces left at the campsite that the bear was stalking them, and a Russian guide warned Michio that he should sleep indoors, but he refused and instead stayed in his tent. You can guess what happened next. At night, the bear ripped through the fabric and dragged Michio away to his death. It is rumored that when Huntsman shot the bear, Michio's hands were found in its stomach. It would seem that the image of a snarling bear said to have been taken by Michio just moments before his death and circulated on the net was actually an entry for a Photoshop competition to create a last photo taken before death. But it's terrifying to think that this is probably what Michio seen before his demise. Sadly, he was only 43 when he died, leaving his wife and son. Gormandur and Giafiner In January 1974, an 18-year-old labourer named Gordimo set off to walk home in a snowstorm. At some point he was seen by a passing motorist, as he almost fell in front of the car. After this, he was never seen again. Ten months later in November, Geofener was at home when he received a phone call. He immediately left and drove to a harbour calf in nearby Keflavik. 
His keys were found in the car ignition, but he too disappeared. This all took place in Iceland, a country with an extremely low murder rate, and the investigation was opened, but the Icelandic police had no witnesses, motive, bodies, or forensic evidence, and the pressure from both the media and the public was intense. Before long, a man named Savar, who was a petty criminal, and his girlfriend, Erla, were picked up and questioned. This began a fantastical tale that became known as the Reykjavik Confessions, which revolved around nightclubs, fraud, smuggling, nightmares, and murder. As well as Savar and Erla, eventually four more suspects signed confessions for the murders, although none of them could actually remember committing the crimes. Those accused were not given any access to their lawyers, were kept in isolation, and interviewed for hours at a time. They were given antipsychotic and sedative drugs, subjected to water torture and sleep deprivation. The suspect said that they signed the confessions to be allowed out of solitary confinement. Erla was held there for 242 days, and another two prisoners were held for over 600. Outside of Guantanamo Bay, these are the longest periods that any defendant has spent in isolation. All six were convicted, and sentences ranged from life imprisonment for Savar to between 12 and 3 years for the others. It wasn't until 2011 that the case became famous for its false memory syndrome, police corruption, and unreliable confessions. The Twin Gynecologist's Strange Death It was an oppressively hot day, and there had been several complaints about the foul smell coming from the fashionable Manhattan apartment of 460 East. On the 17th of July 1975, Bill Terrell was the handyman at the 63rd Street and York Avenue building, so he went up to the 10th floor to take a look. The apartment was locked, but Bill let himself in with the maintenance key. Inside, he found the body of Dr. Cyril Marcus, lying face down on the bed in a pair of shorts. In another room on the floor next to what was almost the same bed, Bill found the body of Cyril's identical twin brother, Dr. Stuart Marcus. He was completely naked and lying face up. The place was a mess, with filthy clothing, empty liquor bottles, soda cans, discarded food and money scattered around. One of the armchairs was smeared with human feces, but there was no sign of any struggle. The medical examiner stated that the twins were in their mid-forties when they died. Stuart had been dead for four days, and Cyril for only two. He thought their deaths could have been caused by drugs or chemicals, but 30 tests were unable to determine what caused the gynecologist's deaths. Although there were said to be over 100 prescription drug bottles, there were no sign of any narcotics or alcohol in either of the men's systems. Growing up, the twins spent all of their time with one another and began their medical residences together also. They wore similar clothing, sometimes talking just to one another and excluding others. They began a private practice were known nationally, and even wrote a classic textbook together. But at some point, the twins' behavior towards their patients became unpredictable and arrogant, as they spiraled into a drug addiction with barbiturates and amphetamines. Pregnant women were shouted and screamed at, and one even had surgical instruments thrown at her. It seems the men tried to kick their habit alone at Cyril's flat after stocking up on food and medication, but at some point between the 10th and 14th of July, it seems that Stuart died. Cyril, who was disorientated, was seen out on the street by the doorman after this date, but returned to the flat where he also died. New tests showed traces of barbiturates in Stuart's body, but the cause of Cyril's death still remains a mystery. The Barari Deaths On the morning of 1st of July 2018, in the Barari district of Delhi, India, 11 members of the Chundawat family were found dead. 10 of them were hanging from the ceiling. The grandmother, being the oldest family member, was found on the bedroom floor strangled, a belt hung from the wardrobe handle. The Chadawats owned a grocery store, which usually opened between 5 and 5.30 a.m. At 7.30 a.m., a neighbor went to see why the shop was still closed. When he saw that the door was open, he stepped inside and found the whole family hanging. The police were sent for, but before their arrival, hundreds of people had turned up at the shop. Some had even gone inside, trampling all over the evidence. 
One person even made a video of the horrific scene and posted it online. Nine of the victims were found close together in the living room, suspended from a metal grill in the skylight, with one female victim suspended alone in a corner. They all had nooses made from brightly coloured saracen wire. They were blindfolded, and some of the bodies had their hands and feet tied with rope. Their heads were wrapped in cloth, their ears plugged with cotton wool, and their mouths taped shut. Eleven diaries were found at the house, which detailed how the younger son, Lalit, had become convinced that he was possessed by the spirit of his dead father. He had become head of the household, and convinced the others, over eleven years, that his orders had to be followed no matter what. The details of an obscure religious ritual were found in the last diary, which matched how the bodies looked when they were found. Could the family have obeyed Lalit, and entered into some sort of ceremony that had gone wrong? As the bodies showed no signs of a struggle, it is possible. So mass suicide, a religious ritual gone wrong, or murder? Either way, eleven members of the same family had died in the most chilling way, the youngest being Lalit's own son, Shivam, who was just 15 years old. Amir Sadiqui it was a perfectly normal Sunday afternoon in Cardiff, Wales, on April 2010, for the Sadakui family. Mum Pavin, Dad Iqbal, and their son, 17-year-old Amir. At just after half past one, Amir went to answer the door, thinking it was his Korean teacher. Instead, two men who were hiding their faces in balaclavas stood on the doorstep. They both held knives and immediately jumped on Amir, stabbing him in a frenzied attack. Amir tried his best to get away from them, even getting to the dining room before he collapsed, but the two assailants didn't stop. They followed the teenager and continued to hack at his body. Amir's parents desperately tried to help their son. Pavin jumped on top of one of the men, while his father tried to pull them away, but the attackers slashed out and injured them both before running out of the house. Amir died at the scene. Both of the murderers, who it turned out were high on heroin at the time, had been howling throughout the attack. The investigation found CCTV footage of the two killers, and Ben Hope and Jason Richards were soon arrested. They blamed each other for the attack, and it emerged that they had been hired by a man named Mohammed al Agi, who had paid them £1,000 each to kill a local businessman who lived in the next street. Mohammed was angry over a property deal that had gone wrong. The businessman lived on Shiley Road, which was next to Ninian Road, where the Sakis lived. In their drug-addled state, the men had gone to the wrong street. Hope and Richards were sentenced to life imprisonment. Mohammed was arrested in New Delhi, India, but he escaped from court in 2017 whilst awaiting extradition. Mohammed is still at large, and anyone with any information is asked to contact the police. Bird Attack on Monterey Bay In August of 1961, Thousands of seabirds suddenly changed from their normal flight path after feeding off the coast of Rio del Mar, California. A thick fog had enveloped Monterey Bay, and the birds needed somewhere to shore. At about 3.30am, they arrived at Capitola, and residents there were awakened by the cacophony of thudding noises on their roofs, and the sounds of seabirds crying like babies as they regurgitated anchovies and knocking themselves out by slamming into buildings. Some residents were brave enough to go outside with flashlights, but found that the frantic avians, which are named sooty shearwaters, flew straight at them. Like something out of a scene from the film The Birds, some people were even bitten. The following morning, the streets were covered with dead and dazed birds and half-eaten anchovies. The survivors were too weak to fly, so the residents gathered them up and took them back to the ocean. There, many made a recovery, but truckloads of the dead birds were taken away and disposed of from all along the Monterey Bay area. So what had caused the birds to become crazed? In 1991, there was another mass of bird deaths in the same area, and scientists found that this was due to a toxic algae bloom. The Scripps Institute for Oceanography had collected zooplankton from Monterey Bay in 1961, which was found to contain a neurotoxin called domoic acid. The anchovies had eaten the deadly algae, and the sooty shearwaters had eaten the anchovies, thereby poisoning themselves and causing memory loss, disorientation and seizures. In 
Navy Blimp Al-8. On the 16th of August 1942, the Al-8 Blimp took off from Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay just after 6am. These non-rigid airships had been used regularly to patrol the seas around the California coast, following the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese in 1941. There were two crew members aboard the Blimp, Lieutenant Junior Grade Ernest DeWitt Cody and Ensign Charles Adams. Both were experienced pilots. Due to a weather issue with the airship, their flight mechanic was unable to join them. At about 7.50, Lieutenant Cody radioed into the control tower to say that they had seen a suspicious oil slick near Farron Islands and were going to investigate. Standby was the last communication to be sent from the L-8 before the signal was lost. Two ships that were in the area reported seeing the airship circling around as though it was searching for something in the water. The blimp dropped several flares into the sea, and at some point between 8am and 9am, it came very low to the water, and the crew could be clearly seen. Then an hour before it was due, the airship headed back towards San Francisco. The pilot of a Pan-American airplane reported seeing the blimp quite steadily passing the Golden Gate Bridge at 11am, but shortly before, it crashed down on a busy street in front of a house at 419 Bellevue Avenue, Daly City. The cockpit was empty, and both of the crew members had vanished. Both parachutes and the life raft were still on board, and the radio was in perfect working order. Despite an extensive search, no trace of the men was ever found. Theories ranged from capture by the Japanese to UFO abduction. Whatever happened to the crew of the Al-8 ghost blimp remains a mystery to this day. Night Deaths of Asian Men In July 1983, the Los Angeles Times printed an article titled Night Deaths of Asian Men Explained. The piece claimed that young and healthy Japanese men and women were dying suddenly in their sleep every year. There had also been similar deaths among Filipinos and Southeast Asian refugees living in the US. The Japanese called the mysterious disease Pokuri, which can be translated to mean that death occurs suddenly with a snap. None of the victims, who were mostly men, suffered from heart disease. In 1980, there were 80 of these deaths just in Tokyo alone, and 76 of them were men. It was estimated that between 500 and 1,000 were dying from Pokori in an average year. It was named Nocturnal Death Syndrome by two American researchers who said it was a baffling phenomenon. In the Philippines, the deaths are said to be caused by a disease called Bangan Gut. The men there are thought to die during or just after a nightmare. The article is thought to have inspired director Wes Craven to write his horror masterpiece, A Nightmare on Elm Street, where teenagers are stalked and killed by Freddy Krueger in their own nightmares. Juliana Kapka, The Lone Survivor Yuliana was born in Lima, Peru. His parents established Panguama, a biological research station in the Amazon rainforest, when she was four. On Christmas Eve of 1971, the now 17-year-old Yuliana and her mother boarded Lancer Flight 508. Her father was not happy with his wife and daughter flying with the airline because it had a bad reputation, but it was the only flight available. The flight encountered thunderstorms and serious turbulence before being struck by lightning. The plane broke apart mid-air, and Yuliana found herself free-falling, still strapped into a seat. She plummeted 10,000 feet before landing in the Peruvian rainforest. With a concussion, broken collarbone, an eye injury, and a deep wound on her right arm, Yuliana drifted in and out of consciousness for half a day. Then following water downstream, she began to trek through the jungle. Yuliana came across three dead passengers, rammed headfirst into the ground but was relieved to find that none of them was her mother. She had to deal with serious insect bites and a maggot-infested arm, but on the tenth day of her nightmare, she found some gasoline in a lodging hut and poured it over the wound. A few hours later, three lodgers discovered her and took her to the hospital, where she was reunited with her father. Later, she was able to take rescuers back to the wreckage of the plane. Of the 96 on board, everyone had died except for Yuliana. About 14 other passengers survived the initial impact, but died while waiting for rescue, including her mother. 
It was later discovered that the aircraft was assembled entirely from spare parts of other planes. The Gainesville Ripper Most people have heard of the 1996 slasher movie Scream, but few will have heard of Daniel Rowling, the real-life serial killer and inspiration behind the film. Rowling was born in Louisiana on May 26, 1954. His father was a police officer, never wanted children, and Danny's childhood was not a happy one. As a teenager, Rowling was arrested a few times for robbery and spying on women, and as he got older, he had trouble holding down a job. He later progressed from robbery to murder. In the early hours of August 24th, 1990, Rowling broke into the apartment of 17-year-old university students, Sonja Larson and Christina Powell. He killed both students in a brutal and terrifying attack. The next day, he broke into the apartment of 18-year-old student, Krista Hoyt, and waited for her to return home. He mercilessly killed Krista in a similar way to Sonia and Christina. Later, returning to cut off Christina's head, and place it on a shelf facing her corpse. Two days later, on August 27th, Rowling broke into the apartment of 23-year-old Tracy Pauls and her roommate Manny Tapoada, also 23. Rowling killed Manny after a struggle and then killed Tracy after she came to investigate the commotion. He then posed her body similarly to his other victims, but he left Manny the only male he killed as he was. All the women he killed bore a striking resemblance to his mother. Despite huge media coverage, Danny Rowling was only caught after he was arrested for an unrelated burglary charge. During his police interview, he confessed to the most horrific student murders in Florida's history and was unmasked as the Gainesville Ripper. On November 1991, Rowling was charged with five counts of murder and sentenced to death. He was executed by lethal injection on October 25th, 2006. The Morehouse Murders One of the most gut-wrenching crime sprees in Australian history was the Morehouse Murders, committed by Catherine and David Burney. The couple claimed their first victim on October 6th, 1986, when they persuaded 22-year-old Mary Nielsen to go to their house on 3 Morehouse Street in Perth to purchase some cheap tyres. When Mary arrived, she was held at knife point and subjected to horrific abuse by David, watched by Catherine, before being taken to Glen Eagles National Park, where again she was tortured, before being strangled and stabbed in the heart. The Burnies then buried Mary in a shallow grave and parked her car near police headquarters. This was the start of a brutal killing spree, where over the course of five weeks, they murdered and tortured three more young women, holding them captive before slaughtering them and forcing them to call or write letters to friends and family, saying they were fine and giving false accounts of their whereabouts. However, their final victim, 17-year-old Kate Moore, managed to escape their clutches and alerted the authorities. Following her escape, the Burnies were arrested and convicted of their crimes. David Burney confessed to the four murders and pleaded guilty at trial, and Catherine was also found guilty and sentenced to four life terms. Although the pair were only tried for these murders, it's been rumoured that they were responsible for the deaths of Barbara Weston and Cheryl Renwick, who also disappeared in Perth in 1986. After nearly 20 years in prison, David Burney hanged himself in 2005, Catherine Burney remains incarcerated to this day, becoming only the third woman in the history of Australia to be marked, never to be released. The Black Panther From an early age, Donald Nappy was in trouble with the law and had an unhappy childhood after the death of his mother when he was 10. When he married and had a child of his own in 1960, Donald changed the family surname from Nappy to Nielsen, 
so that the little girl would not suffer the bullying and abuse he had endured because of it. Before his killing spree, Nielsen committed over 400 house burglaries without detection by adopting a different modus operandi every few weeks, before moving on to more lucrative post office raids. He committed his first three murders in 1974 when he shot dead two sub postmasters and the husband of a sub postmistress. Nielsen was later dubbed the Black Panther after one of his victims' wives mentioned he was quick like a panther and dressed in black. On January 14, 1975, Nielsen broke into the home of the Whittle family in Highley, Shropshire, and kidnapped their 17-year-old daughter, Leslie. He left a ransom note in the house, demanding £50,000 for Leslie's safe return. However, a series of police bungles and other circumstances resulted in Whittle's brother, Ronald, being unable to deliver the ransom money to the place and at the time demanded by Nielsen. Sadly, Leslie Whittle's body was found on March 7, 1975, hanging from a wire at the bottom of the drainage shaft where Nielsen had tethered her in Bathpool Park in Staffordshire. Nielsen did not physically cause her death. She died of heart failure after falling off the ledge Nielsen kept her on. It is thought initially Nielsen was feeding Leslie, but it seemed a few days before her death he abandoned her. Nielsen was finally caught after he attempted and nearly succeeded in kidnapping two police officers who stopped to question him. In July 1976, Nielsen was convicted of the kidnapping and murder of Leslie Whittle, two postmasters and the husband of a postmistress. In total, Nielsen received five life sentences. He died in prison on December 17, 2011 from breathing difficulties. The Teacup Poisoner Graham Young was born in North London in 1947. His mother died when he was a baby, and the upheaval of first living with his aunt, and then with his father, and his new family, deeply affected young Graham. He became very introverted, and developed solo hobbies that included a particular fascination with chemistry and toxicology. He also enjoyed reading books about notorious murderers, his father Frank encouraged his son's interest in science by buying him a chemistry set, and rather than playing with his school friends, Graham spent hours doing experiments. So much so, the pupils at his school named him the Mad Professor. As a teenager, Young managed to acquire large quantities of poisonous chemicals, and soon his test subjects progressed to humans. He started serving his deadly concoctions to his family and schoolmates, laced in tea to see what effect it had. In 1961, members of his family and a classmate developed severe stomach cramps. Nobody suspected that Young had anything to do with the mysterious illnesses. They assumed it was some kind of contagious stomach bug. But when one of his sisters was taken to hospital, doctors discovered belladonna, the ancient extract of deadly nightshade in her system. She recovered, but Graham's stepmother Molly was not so lucky, and on April 21st, 1962, Molly Young died in excruciating pain. It was found out later that Young had been slowly poisoning his stepmother's tea with Antomy, to which she developed a tolerance. The night before her death, he switched to Thallium to quicken the process. However, Young's aunt, the one he had lived with as a young child, knew about his fascination with poison and became suspicious. She had him sent to a psychiatrist who recommended calling the police. On May 23, 1962, Graham Young was arrested. He confessed to the murder of his stepmom, as well as the poisoning of his other family members. But due to Molly's cremation, there was no evidence to charge him, so instead he was placed in Broadmoor Maximum Security Hospital in the UK, an incredibly notorious hospital that we should probably do a video on. At age 14, Young became Broadmoor's youngest inmate, and was released eight years later. Once released, Young got a job in a laboratory and willingly offered to make coffee and tea for his co-workers. Before long, sickness swept through the lab, resulting in the death of Bob Eggle in 1971. A second death followed, and nearly 70 employees experienced similar symptoms. Ultimately, Young threw suspicion on himself when he asked the staff doctor 
why thallium poisoning wasn't being considered a cause since it was used on site. The doctor reported the comment and the police were alerted. After an investigation, they found Young's diary in which he described how he poisoned his co-workers. Young was sentenced to life in prison in June 1972 and died of a heart attack in 1990. The Confession Killers Drawn together by shared childhood trauma, Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole became lovers, then serial killers, who terrorized America in the 1970s. When they were both arrested for separate crimes, they claimed to have murdered hundreds of people and became known as the Confession Killers. Both Lucas and Toole had been raised by abusive mothers who had forced their sons to dress like girls. Both had suffered sexual trauma before the age of 10, and by the time they met, both had already murdered. With Lucas killing his own mother in 1960, a crime he only served 10 years for. In the 1970s, Lucas and Toole traveled extensively across 26 states, but their once close relationship fell apart when Lucas started a relationship with O'Toole's teenage niece, Becky Powell. Toole was so upset that he allegedly killed nine people after the breakup. But Lucas and Becky didn't last long, and after an argument, Lucas killed her, dismembered her body, and scattered her remains in a field in Texas. He also killed the woman who owned the ranch they were living in at the time, and stuffed her body into a drainage pipe. In 1983, Lucas was arrested for possession of a deadly weapon, and once in custody, he began to confess to hundreds of unsolved murders. Around the same time, Toole had been arrested and jailed in Florida for burning a 64-year-old man alive. At last, the killer couple were behind bars, but it was just the start of a bizarre mystery that remains unsolved to this day. Lucas claimed that he and Toole killed everywhere they went. They preyed upon anyone they encountered and shared a mutual love of murder, torture, rape and cannibalism. At first, Toole was reluctant to talk about his crimes, but when he learned that Lucas was taking police on guided tours of their murder sites and enjoying certain privileges, he confessed that together they murdered 108 people, including the high-profile unsolved murder of six-year-old Adam Walsh, the son of future America's most wanted host, John Walsh. Toole claimed he decapitated the boy with a machete and drove around with his head in his car for months before tossing it into a canal. Meanwhile, Lucas readily confessed to more than 600 murders, offering grisly detail of the crimes and drawing pictures of them. For a long time, police believed both men, but slowly, with improvements in forensics, their confessions began to unravel. Although, there were some investigators that still believed they were telling the truth. Eventually, Toole was convicted of six murders and died in prison in 1996 of cirrhosis, age 49. Lucas was convicted of two murders in addition to his mother, and he died age 64 of heart failure in 2001, taking the truth about their murder count with them. It's worth noting that false confessions have terrible consequences for both the victims' families and the reputation of the police, and could mean the real killers behind these fake confessions could still be out there. The Livonian Werewolf Thies of Kaltenbrunn, commonly referred to as the Livonian Werewolf, was an elderly Livonian man who was arrested in 1692 for heresy. At his trial, Thies shocked the judge by openly declaring himself to be a werewolf, claiming that he ventured into hell with other werewolves in order to do battle with the devil and his witches. He claimed that on the nights of St. Lucia's Day, Pentecost and St. John's Day, he and the other werewolves transformed from their human bodies into wolves. Thies explained he had first become a werewolf when he was a beggar on the streets of Sweden, where he met a man who drank a toast to him and gave him the ability to transform into a wolf. He said he could then pass on his ability to transform into a wolf to someone else by toasting them, breathing into the jug three times and proclaiming, you will become like me. Thies stated that he and the other werewolves wandered around local farms and ripped apart any farm animals they came across. 
before roasting the meat and devouring it. And they all travelled to a place that was located beyond the sea, where they entered into hell. There they met the devil, and battled with him and his loyal malevolent witches, beating them with long iron rods and chasing them like dogs. However, he claimed that he was a hound of God, and he was a werewolf for the good of Christianity, not against it. The judge disagreed, and deemed him guilty of trying to turn people away from Christianity, and he was sentenced to be both flogged and banished for life. The Welsh Werewolf Wales is not the first place you think of when talking about werewolves, but it seems it's had its fair share of stories about strange wolf-like creatures. The first recorded event happened one night in 1790. At the time, the moon had acquired a strange red hue, which the locals believed to be a bad sign, an omen of impending evil. The moon lit the way as a stagecoach travelled between Denby and Wrexham when its journey was halted when an enormous black beast lunged at the coach from the shadows and attacked the horses. It tore one of them to shreds, and the other broke free and galloped off into the darkness, pursued by the wolf-like beast. Little more than a year later, a farmer from the Gresford area discovered tracks in the snow, but these were no ordinary tracks. They were huge and could only have been produced by an enormous creature. Fearing for his safety, the farmer called on a local blacksmith to follow the tracks with him, which led them to a neighbouring farm. There, they were confronted with total carnage. The snow was a shade of deep red, and not a single animal had survived. They had all been torn to shreds. Cattle, sheep, and even the farmer's sheepdog. The men approached the farmhouse, fearing the worst, and to their relief the farmer appeared, unharmed, although he had barricaded himself in. He told them how he had watched in horror as an enormous black wolf-like animal had set upon his animals, and then chased him before he managed to lock himself in the house. The beast foamed at the mouth as it reared up on the windows, trying to get in. The locals believed, at the time, that only a werewolf could have inflicted such damage to livestock, and they organised a hunt, but despite covering plenty of tracks, no werewolf was found. Seven years later, the beast struck again. The two men witnessed the chilling silhouette of the creature against the rising. It lifted its head and let out a howl that struck fear into their hearts. The werewolf had returned. Scared for their lives, the two men took shelter in a nearby inn. The next day, in a wood about five miles from the inn, the bodies of two vagrants were found. They had been mutilated beyond belief and appeared to have been slashed to a virtual pulp by something with blade-like claws. Both their heads were missing and appeared to have been ripped from their bodies. One head was later found, minus its face and ears. Shortly after the incident, one of the local ministers received a strange letter. The writer claimed that the two men had been killed by a werewolf that had been stalking the area for more than 100 years, and that to avoid a similar fate befalling anyone else, he should paint crosses on each door in the village. He claimed that the werewolf embodied the spirit of an evil warlock who had been burnt at the stake in the 1400s by the ancestors of the village folk. The horrific killing sprees finally deceased, and it seemed that the reign of the Welsh werewolf was over, at least for now. War Cemetery Werewolf in 2009, a supernatural survey revealed 20 werewolf sightings have been reported at Cannock Chase, the famous paranormal hotspot in England. The report was put together by lead paranormal researcher Lionel Fanthorpe, who studied police reports and archives of groups who explored ghostly and unexplained events to collate the sightings. It showed that in 1975, a paranormal group encountered a snarling beast in the woods. It reared up on its hind legs and ran off into the bushes. A similar sighting was reported in 2007, when a West Midlands ghost club had been called in to investigate claims from people who'd seen a werewolf-type creature prowling around the chase. The wolf was seen walking upright in the German War Cemetery on Camp Road. The credible eyewitness accounts came from a local scoutmaster and a postman, who claimed they'd come face to face with the werewolf. At first, they thought it was a large dog, until it raised up on its haunches revealing its full height was over seven foot. 
A month after this sighting, a story was printed in a local paper claiming the werewolf could actually be a subterranean Stone Age throwback that could have lived for centuries in the old mines under Canuck Chase, only surfacing when they needed to eat. This could also explain the disappearance of a number of domestic pets that have gone missing over the years in the area around the War Cemetery. As you have mentioned before on this channel, Canuck Chase is a hotspot for all things paranormal, and adding a werewolf into the mix seems quite plausible, seeing as it's considered to be the most haunted location in the UK. The Reincarnated Werewolf of Ainsbach In 1685, a wolf began attacking livestock in the Bavarian town of Ainsbach. Before long, the beast moved onto humans and killed several children within a few months. The terrified villager believed this was no ordinary wolf, but rather a werewolf. They claimed was the reincarnation of Michael Light, the detested former burgomaster of Ainsbach, who had recently passed away. They believed he had escaped eternal death by transforming his spirit into the body of a wolf. The locals were determined to hunt down the wolf to protect their children and free the town from the spirit of the hated burgomaster. They prepared a wolf pit with stone walls about three or four meters deep and covered with branches. They placed a dead rooster at the bottom of the pit to lure the beast. After several hours, the wolf fell into the hole and was killed by hunters. However, that was not the end of the story. The animal carcass was paraded through the streets to show the danger was over. But since this was no ordinary wolf, but a werewolf, what they did next was truly grotesque. After skinning the animal, the men severed its muzzle and placed on its head a mask with light's features. They then dressed it in a wig and a cloak and hung the wolf on a gibbet erected on a nearby hill. The ritual had a double purpose. By depriving the wolf of its fur and replacing it with human clothes, showed Satan that his trick did not work and that the townspeople could recognize the man concealed in the body of the beast. It also served as the post-execution of the former ruler who the people failed to overthrow in life, and to send a grim warning to the new burgomaster not to make the same mistake as the old one. US wildlife experts are baffled by a wolf-like animal that was killed by a Montana farmer. In 2018, a mysterious wolf-like creature was shot dead in the US. It baffled wildlife experts who had no idea what it was, the animal was killed by a farmer after he spotted it, worrying his livestock, in Denton, Montana. Soon theories circulated online, suggesting anything from a young grizzly bear, a coyote, hybrid, or proof that werewolves exist. Experts confirmed it was a member of the dog family that includes dogs, foxes, coyotes, and wolves, although it didn't have traditional wolf features because its teeth were too short and claws too large, and there was something off about it. To this day, it's still not confirmed, so could it be the elusive werewolf, or just a wolf-dog hybrid bred in captivity and released into the wild? What do you think? The Werewolf of Alariz In 19th century Spain, serial killer Manuel Blanco Romasanta claimed the reason for his murderous reign was because he was a wolf. Manuel was born into a wealthy family in northwest Spain, However, his parents believed him to be female, and originally named him Manuela. His gender confusion was not resolved until a doctor corrected them six years later. In his early teens, Manuel stopped growing and stood at just four foot six tall. As an adult, he worked as a tailor and a tour guide. He married briefly, but his wife died suddenly in 1833, after which Manuel became a traveling salesman through Spain and Portugal. In 1844, he was charged with murder after he killed Vincent Fernandez, the constable of Leon. But Manuel didn't attend his trial and instead went on the run. For many years, he worked jobs considered abnormal for men in those times, including yarn making and cooking, and resumed his work as a tour guide. However, his clients started disappearing. Manuel kept up correspondence with the families of the missing, so they were none the wiser. The ruse worked for a time, until Manuel was spotted selling clothes belonging to the missing people. In 1852, 
a complaint was filed in the city of Escalona that claimed Manuel had turned the body fat of his murder victims into soap and sold the bars to the public. The gruesome allegation turned out to be true. In September of the same year, Manuel was arrested and brought to trial in Alariz for the murder of 13 people, ranging in age from 10 to 47. His defense, however, was unlike anything ever heard in a court of law. Manuel claimed to be a victim of lycanthropy, an illness that made him transform into a werewolf and roam the streets looking for prey. This is what he said. The first time I transformed was in the mountains of Cuso. I came across two furious looking wolves. I suddenly fell to the floor and began to feel convulsions. I rolled over three times and a few seconds later I myself was a wolf. I was out meandering with the other two for five days until I returned to my own body, the one you see before you today. The other two wolves came with me, who I thought were also wolves, changed into human form. They were from Valencia. One was called Antonio and the other Don Gennaro. They too were cursed. We attacked and ate a number of people because we were hungry. Ultimately, Manuel was acquitted of four murders, ironically because the victims had shown signs of dying in real wolf attacks. He was found guilty of the other nine slayings and sentenced to death by garroting. This was later commuted to life imprisonment. On December 14, 1863, Manuel died behind bars. His cause of death was stomach cancer. However, there is a persistent rumor that suggests he was shot by a guard who wanted to witness him transform into a wolf. Old Stinker, Barmston Drain in Hull. In 2016, residents of Hull, a Yorkshire city in the UK, reported seeing an eight foot tall hairy humanoid creature prowling a derelict industrial area just outside the city centre. Eyewitnesses described it as half man, half dog that stood upright one moment and the next was down on all fours running like a dog. One resident described how it vaulted over a 30 foot fence and vanished up an embankment. Another said that they seen something tall and hairy jump over an eight-foot fence, carrying a German shepherd dog in its jaws. The sightings have been linked to the local legend of a werewolf called Old Stinker, described as a great hairy beast with red eyes, who got its name due to its foul-smelling breath. The legend of Old Stinker has been around for decades, and in recent years, he is thought to reside near Balmston Drain a man-made waterway that runs through Hull. It's a popular spot for fishing and bird watching, but it's also known for its eerie atmosphere. It is said that Old Stinker, a werewolf-like creature, roams around the area at night. Some people claim to have seen it, while others have heard its howls in the distance. The legend likely derived from a time when wolves roamed freely in the UK and were known to dig up corpses from graveyards. From that sprung the idea that they were supernatural beings who took the form of werewolves. The Werewolf of Bedburg In October 1589, a baying crowd gathered in the German city of Bedburg. They were there to witness the execution of Peter Stump, a 50-year-old farmer who confessed to making a pact with the devil to gain the ability to turn into a werewolf. Stump had committed multiple murders and cannibalism. He killed 13 children, including his own son, and three adults, and allegedly after killing his son, he ate his brain. Stump claimed he transformed into a wolf by wearing a wolfskin belt, given to him by the devil. By removing the belt, he could return back to his human form. After the murders and livestock deaths, villagers formed patrols to hunt down the perpetrator and Stump was spotted in his wolf form and chased. It claimed when they caught up with him, he removed his magic belt and reverted back to human in full view of his pursuers. However, once the mob confirmed who he really was, he was arrested. Stump confessed to the crimes, although he was likely under great duress to do so. He was later condemned to death. His execution was brutal. He was strapped to a wheel and skinned alive. His bones were broken. He was decapitated and then his body was burned at the stake. As a warning to everyone, his head was later impaled on a post in the centre of the village.
terrifying werewolf caught on camera. This next clip is fairly recent. It was uploaded to TikTok by user Bigfoot Anonymous and seems to show a mysterious figure running across a back garden. We don't know a whole lot about it, but the large entity appears to have shaggy hair and runs on all fours. Take a look. Commenters have said it looks like some sort of canine, and many believe it's either a werewolf or Bigfoot. It is not known where the video was captured, and we'll leave it up to you to decide what you think it is. Werewolf remains. Finishing up this list, we'll take a look at the werewolf remains found in Lincolnshire. In the middle 1800s, a young archaeologist who lived in Langrick Fen, not far from Dogdyke, was digging in the peat and discovered some ancient remains. Among them was what looked like a human skeleton with a wolf's head. The man took the remains back to his cottage and placed them on his kitchen table to examine them, but was baffled and eventually concluded that it must be some put together monstrosity, possibly used at a fair to excite the interest of the crowd. That night, however, he found himself very restless and unable to sleep and thought he heard a noise out in the back garden. He got up tentatively and went to investigate, when suddenly he heard a loud tap on the window. As he looked through the pane, he could see a dark figure looking at him in the form of a human with a wolf's head. As the young man stood frozen with horror, the creature snarled and raised its arms and smashed the glass. The man quickly fled to the kitchen, locking the door and barricading himself in with furniture. He stayed there all night. As the morning light started to stream through, the man decided to venture out of his makeshift barricade and open the door. He could see no sign of the creature, however the table where he had placed the remains he found the previous day was overturned and the window shards covered the floor. He quickly gathered up the remains and took them back to where he found them and reburied them. The man was never bothered again by the wolf man and never dared to revisit his grave. The Hickory Bigfoot Sighting In August 2019, Hickory resident and Bigfoot hunter Doug Teague filmed what he claims was one of the clearest videos of a North Carolina Bigfoot ever seen. Doug was walking his dog, Crazy Daisy, through woods just outside of the city. He was checking some trail cams when he heard a loud knocking sound in the distance. As he got closer, he spotted an unrecognizable creature on top of a ridge and started to record it. He then followed the huge creature's footprints and took casts of them. Take a look. He's still up here. Or something's up here. He's moving. He's moving, he's moving, he's moving. Daisy, come here. Daisy, come here. I want to do a quick little video here. Me and Crazy Daisy has followed these tracks. This is the best one of them. I'm going to try to cast it. Stepped on a limb. And it goes. Let's see. Here's one. Right here. Here, you can see a little bit where he's smashed. See the toes. Doug claims as he approached the creature, it started throwing stones at him, not something a bear or any other animal would do. Later, the footprint casts were looked at by an anthropologist who thought that the prints belonged to a creature around 15 foot tall. Other experts agreed the footprints looked genuine. So, what do you think Doug saw? Could it really be a Bigfoot? or just another elaborate hoax. Bigfoot Sighting in San Gabriel, California, 2020. In 2020, a hiker in the San Gabriel Wilderness in California 
pulled out his camera to record the stunning landscape, but as he pans around, he spots something in the trees below and zooms in. The large creature appears to be about 10 to 15 feet, although strangely it doesn't appear to move. The area is not usually known for Bigfoot sightings. However, in 2018, a woman walking in San Bernardino Mountains, located about 70 miles east of San Gabriel, claims she also spotted a Sasquatch up in a tree. Here she is speaking about her experience. My daughters were about 10, 20 feet behind me. And I, as I turn around, I'm looking straight and I see the creature on that tree. So what I do is I continue walking closer to, to try to tell myself, am I seeing a shadow at tree strum? At that point, I see his head turn. So I know that I'm not looking at a shadow. And this is where I stop. And this is where everything pretty much happens. This is where my daughter videotaped from your angle. I swear to God, mom. Yeah. Yeah. Could they be the same creature or is there a more plausible explanation? What do you think? I think it's time to go. In 2015, a mushroom hunter got more than he bargained for whilst foraging in a mushroom forest in Northern Illinois. Take a look at this footage he uploaded to his YouTube channel, Tomorrow's Garden. And this one looks like it has a bite out of it. <laughs> and this one. And uh, there's one over here. Looks like it's holding some water. Huh? I think it's time to go. It all seems pretty legit, although someone pointed out at the time, it sounded like it came from a movie. We're unsure on this one, although the Mushroom Hunter did do a follow-up video six years later, but this time nothing was heard. This one was featured on the History Channel, but what do you make of it? Bigfoot UK Bigfoot is usually associated with rural mountainous areas in America. However, there have been several lesser known sightings in the United Kingdom, and in 2021, Bigfoot enthusiast Lee Brickley says he found tracks and claw marks that prove an ape-like beast is living in the forests of Britain. He found the prints in Cannock Chase, Staffordshire, a 26 square mile forest that for centuries has been plagued with paranormal activity and supernatural phenomena, from child spirits to UFOs and werewolves, as well as sightings of a yeti-like creature dating back to the 1800s. Take a look at the photos Lee took of the prints. Lee claims they measured a terrifying 41 centimeters from toe to heel, nearly twice the size of an average male footprint, and far too large to be from any animal native to the UK. About a month after spotting the footprints, Lee found huge claw marks on a tree in the same area. He said close by was a mutilated deer that was covered in bite marks and had its throat ripped out. Take a look at the claw marks. Reports of these sightings seem to have drastically increased in number since the beginning of 2019, with many believing there is some unknown creature roaming the forest of Canuck Chase. Perhaps we'll have to take a trip down and see for ourselves. Jonestown, Pennsylvania print. Throughout the years, the state of Pennsylvania has had a slew of intriguing Sasquatch encounters with the first dating back to 1858, when there was a series of wild man sightings that put fear into the locals. Described as a hairy man that walked upright, the creature terrorized livestock and residents alike. However, perhaps the most convincing evidence that there was an unknown creature in the area occurred in August 1980, when locals in the Conoma Township area of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, discovered a massive print in the mud that appeared to belong to somebody or something's right foot. It had six toes and must have had a giant stride as the second imprint of the left foot was found eight feet away from the right. The print was found close to someone's home and was said to measure over 17 inches. Reports of a repugnant odor in the area were also reported, as well as bizarre noises like nothing they had heard before. The incident made the newspapers and to this day has neither been solved or debunked.
squeaky thermal. In April 2009, Michael Green shot three minutes of video through a thermal imager. The footage was filmed in the Uari National Forest in North Carolina. Green, a retired Chief of State Ford investigator, had been searching for Sasquatch for the past 20 years and believes he finally found proof of the elusive beast. In 2008, he briefly saw the creature in the National Forest and over the next year, frequently returned trying to encourage it to show its face again. He camped out overnight and left out bananas, apples, peanut butter, zagnut bars, and little squeaky toys, hence the squeaky thermal as the clip is known. His patience finally paid off when at around 11.30pm on April 28, 2009, Green heard rustling in the woods. He set up the thermal imager and put it on a tripod with a digital video recorder and left the area. He then parked up and waited two hours before returning. By this time, the battery on the imager was dead, but the bait was gone. Before we show you what was recorded, it's worth noting that a thermal imager only sees images made by heat. So for example, if a man was dressed in a costume, the image would be patchy and irregular, as his costume would suppress the body heat, whereas a naked man or other creature would appear primarily as a solid color. Take a look. Green estimates the creature was around 7.5 feet tall, although it's hard to be exact. It took one of the Zagnut bars before retreating backwards and then reappearing, swaying slowly back and forth. Is this, as some have suggested, an actual Sasquatch or some other unidentified creature? What do you think? Life-changing horror in Canada. This next true encounter happened in Canada near the city of Nujat in Hudson Bay. Cynthia Gwem had moved from Eastern Europe to Canada as a child and was an avid explorer, often venturing out into the snow-covered wilderness. After a particularly bad week, Cynthia, then 26 years old, decided to spend the weekend exploring. As he ventured out into the snow, he followed an unfamiliar path and was shocked when he came across a huge mound of excrement. He didn't think much of it, he just figured it was a bear or some other creature. After trekking further, he became aware of an overwhelming stench. He looked around to see the source and discovered something had urinated over a tree. And this was not an average amount of urine, it was a vast quantity. Again, he didn't think too much of it and carried on and set up camp. As darkness set in, Sincer sat admiring the stars. The flames from the campfire lit up the trees behind him and he caught sight of a face. It had pink human features, but it wasn't a human. Whatever it was, hurried away, but Sincere was so disturbed that he felt he needed to get away. However, in the dark, that wasn't a viable option, so instead he built the fire as big as he could to try and deter what it was that was watching him. As he tried to settle, he heard a nightmare-inducing scream. He couldn't see anything, but knew something was there. Things got worse as more screams were heard and the noise encompassed him. He had to make a decision to get out of there. He felt that he had stumbled into Bigfoot territory and there was more than one creature surrounding him. Terrified, he made a run for it. As he ran, he bumped into something but managed to get up and kept going. He could still hear the screaming of the creatures but he just kept running. Instead of getting away from the noise, he seemed to be running towards it. In the darkness, he spotted the outline of more than one bipedal creature slamming their huge arms into the ground and jumping up and down. Before he knew it, he was being chased. In the darkness, he found himself airborne as he plunged down a bank. No longer able to carry on, he lay injured on the ground, resigned to his fate as the creatures moved closer. Suddenly there was a silence. They all retreated, and all he could hear now was the sounds of cars on a nearby road. Somehow he dragged himself to the roadside and flagged down a car. Since he has spent many weeks in hospital to treat his physical and psychological injuries, However, despite his vivid claims about Bigfoot chasing him, he was considered sane. Once he was released, he didn't talk about what happened. This story came from leaked hospital records, and the whereabouts of Sincer are unknown. Jacob's Bigfoot We featured this one before, but it's so strange we thought we'd feature it again for those who haven't seen it. In 2007, Bigfoot enthusiasts went wild when Rick Jacobs captured two images 
of what people believe is a young Bigfoot roaming the Allegheny National Forest in northwest Pennsylvania. Rick was using a Bushnell trial camera attached to a tree to track deer in the woods, ready for the fall deer hunt. However, when he looked through the footage, he noticed something unusual. At first, you can see bear cubs walking past the camera, and one appears to be sniffing the deer bait and mineral block put down by Rick. Then, shortly after, the unidentified animal can be seen walking past in two shots. The camera has around a 30 second delay per photo, so the camera only managed to take two photographs of the creature. It's believed by many to be nothing more than a bear with a skin disease, whilst others believe it is some sort of primate and very unlikely to be a bear, even though there is no primate roaming the woods in northwest Pennsylvania. The other explanation is it's a juvenile Bigfoot. What do you think? Real or fake? In 2013, three Russian school children claimed to have filmed a yeti in the trees in the Kemerovo region of southern Siberia. The blurred footage taken on one of the boys' mobile phones shows them following giant footprints in the snow. As they get closer to the bushes, they see a figure about 50 meters in front of them. Take a look. It appeared to notice them as well, and moved sharply before running off. The boys, who appeared shocked, ran in the opposite direction. Experts reviewed the footage and believed it was genuine. However, whether the figure was a yeti or there was a more plausible explanation has never been confirmed. What do you think? Hike from Hal. In 2009, an experienced hiker who we will call John, traveled to Redding, California to catch up with an old college friend and do a spot of hiking. The trip was going well until on the third day, his friend was feeling unwell, so he went alone. The hike would take John along Lake Shasta, where he intended to take photos of the stunning views. However, after two miles of hiking, John realized he had left his camera behind. Extremely frustrated, John decided to carry on anyway. As he weaved through the trees towards his next destination, John got the odd feeling that he was not alone, so he stopped and looked around, but could see nothing. Feeling vulnerable and alone deep in the forest, John retrieved his knife from his backpack. He carried on walking, checking as he went, when suddenly he heard a rock hitting a tree. By now, John was getting nervous and stepped up his pace. As he walked, he could hear a loud cracking coming from his right, followed by a rock thrown in front of him. John could also hear footsteps behind him, when he reached a clearing, he was relieved, until he realized the only way back was the way he came. John reached for his phone, but there was zero signal. His only escape was to go back through the forest. After some time, John decided to go for it and moved as quickly as he could, racked with fear and aware that whatever it was was still following him. As he stepped at the pace, so did the follower. And just as John thought he was getting to the end, he tripped on a root and face planted into the undergrowth. John lay there briefly before realizing his knee was in great pain. As he looked at his damaged knee, to the left, something stood over him. It was tall, covered in reddish brown hair, and looked like an ape. It had a hairy face with grayish skin underneath, and it was staring right at him. Injured and terrified, John got up and slowly limped away. Thankfully, the creature did not follow this time, and he made it back to his car safely. John is convinced he encountered a Bigfoot that day, an intelligent creature that backed off once it knew he was hurt. He has since returned to Lake Shasta and has never seen it again, but he has done countless hours of research and believes the creature was more intelligent than a normal animal, although he still has no idea what he encountered that day. What do you think chased John in that forest? The Copper Scroll Treasure an ancient copper scroll discovered at the site of Qumran 
in 1952 began an archaeological mystery that has never been solved. The scroll was found alongside the Dead Sea Scrolls in what is now the West Bank in Palestine. It dates back over 2,000 years to a time when the Roman Empire was in control of the Qumran settlement. Researchers have long believed that the scroll describes where huge hordes of gold and silver are buried that were hidden by locals to stop the Romans getting their hands on it. But the trouble is, no one can decipher what is written, so to date, the location of the treasure and the true meaning behind the scroll is still a mystery. Rainbow Clouds Rainbow clouds are an extremely rare weather phenomenon that when witnessed, leaves some people feeling like something supernatural is about to happen. Not really a mystery, but certainly wondrous, and you can only think what our ancestors would have thought when witnessing something like this. This clip was filmed over Haiku City in China and left the internet stunned. Incredible, and despite fears that they signal the end of time or are the portal to another dimension, there is in fact a perfectly valid scientific explanation for the spectacle. The atmospheric optical phenomenon called cloud iridescence occurs when water droplets or ice crystals in the cloud distract the light around the outside of the droplet, as opposed to bending the light through it, meaning the colours are not as uniform as in a regular rainbow, but much more vivid. The formation is often short-lived, and very few people around the world will get to see one, as spectacular as the one in China. How will the universe end? Well, according to science, it will end in one of three ways. The Big Chill, Crunch, or Rip. With the Big Chill or Big Freeze, dark energy forces would force the universe to gradually expand until all that remains are burned out stars and dead planets whose temperatures would drop to an unsurvivable absolute zero, or minus 273.15 degrees. The Big Crunch is basically a mirror image of the Big Bang. If the amount of dark energy is not enough to resist the compressing force of gravity, the entire universe could collapse into a singular point. And the Big Rip is a scenario in which dark energy overwhelms all other forces, causing all galaxies, stars, and even atoms to be torn apart. We talk more about this, and all things astronomy, over on our space channel, Access Astronomy. All of these scenarios are catastrophic, but in reality, no one really knows the answer, or when this will happen. Just like our lives today were never promised, neither is the future. That's why you must take every moment to appreciate what you have right now, because we have no idea what the future holds, or when it will end. The Scottish Pompeii Unlike the Pyramids of Giza or Stonehenge, Scarabray in Scotland is relatively unknown. However, this Neolithic site predates both Stonehenge and the Pyramids. In 1850, Scotland was battered by a horrific storm that claimed the lives of over 200 people. When it settled down, it left behind something extraordinary on the coast of mainland Orkney. The force of the high tides and strong winds had stripped away part of a knoll and uncovered the ruins of several small, roofless houses close to the shore of Bayo Scale. Initial efforts to excavate the site were pretty amateurish, and eventually it was abandoned in 1868. It remained untouched until 1925, when another storm damaged the structures. During efforts to protect the site, a seawall was built that uncovered even more houses. The homes were all consistent in design, each featuring a single central room with a fireplace, and beds on either side. At first it was believed the houses had been occupied by people during the Iron Age, but with the emergence of radiocarbon dating in the 1970s, evidence suggested the site was much, much older, and that the Scara Bray's earliest residents settled in 3180 BC, and stayed in the area for over 600 years placing the site in the Neolithic Age. The artefacts found at the site are so well preserved that it's the best preserved Neolithic human settlement in Northern Europe. So what happened to the people who lived there, and why did they move out after 600 years, leaving so many of their belongings behind? It's theorized that they were fleeing from some disaster, and this evokes the image 
of Vesuvius raining down on the citizens of Pompeii. It's a thought that has earned Scarabray its nickname, the Scottish Pompeii. However, the truth is, nobody knows why they left. Although the most likely explanation is that the area was buried gradually over time until the dunes completely swallowed up the settlement. Now, Scarabray is slowly being swallowed up by the ocean, and it remains to be seen whether this unique window into the ancient past will ultimately be buried forever, taking its secrets with it. Black to transparent in an instant. This footage of a squid is incredible and shows just how wonderful nature can be. When the video first surfaced, many believed it was fake, but we believe that it's genuine and shows either a glass squid or a reef squid reacting to the circumstance it finds itself in. The squid is a cephalopod, a group that includes octopuses, squid, and cuttlefish, some of which are skilled at changing color in as little as 200 milliseconds. They do this for several reasons, including to communicate, startle, or warn potential predators, or as attraction for mating. In the case of the one in the video, it is likely he's changing color because he was scared. The Disappearance of the San Singdui. In 1929, a man repairing a sewage ditch in China's Sichuan province uncovered a treasure trove of jade and stone artifacts. Further excavation was not carried out at the time, and a lot of the treasure ended up in the hands of private collectors. It wasn't until 1986, when the site was being excavated by archaeologists, that two more pits full of Bronze Age treasures, including jade, elephant tusks, and bronze sculptures were unearthed. But who created these hidden wonders? It's believed that members of the San Xingdui civilization were responsible, an ancient culture that collapsed between 3,000 and 2,800 years ago. It is known that the San Xingdui lived in a walled city beside the banks of the Minjiang River. However, why they left and buried so many of their precious possessions in pits is a mystery. It has been suggested that maybe an earthquake rerouted the Minjiang River, causing the residents to flee. However, like many things from ancient history, no one really knows. The Mysterious Oran Pendic The island of Sumatra is Indonesia's largest island and the sixth largest in the world. Its tropical climate is host to a wide range of plants and animal species although in recent years, it has lost almost 50% of its rainforest, and many of the species that live there are now critically endangered. And that may include an unknown species of ape that is said to have roamed the forest for the past 100 years. Known as the Orang Pending, or Short Man, the creature is said to walk upright, standing at around 4-5 to five feet tall, with powerfully built shoulders and long muscular arms. Witnesses describe it as covered in black or honey-coloured hair, with a mane running down its back. Sightings date back to the 1920s, some of them at very close range. In May 1927, a Dutch plantation worker called A.H.W. Kramer reported seeing an orang pendic from a distance of only 10 metres. It had long hair and black skin. The beast supposedly ran away, leaving small human-like footprints. The same year, the creature was said to have been caught in a tiger trap, but broke free. The traces of blood it left were examined by zoologist H.K. Dammerman, who concluded that it was not from a bear, gibbon, or human. It's believed the creature is a small, immensely strong, non-human primate that resembles a very muscular gibbon, which is probably an undiscovered great ape closely related to the orangutan. Although the native people of Sumatra ascribe no supernatural powers to the creature, they do fear the beast, because even though it is not known to be aggressive, when scared, it will use rocks and sticks to protect itself. Nowadays, the creature is only witnessed in the west of the island, specifically in and around Karinsi Seblat National Park. If zoologists can prove this creature exists, not only will it be an astounding discovery, but it may give vital clues to how bipedalism evolved into our own species. We'll probably create a documentary on the Orang Pendig on our Early Humans YouTube channel in the future. But if you'd like us to do an in-depth podcast episode on this mysterious creature on our Hit the Lights podcast, 
let us know in the comment section below. Fate of the Ark of the Covenant The Ark of the Covenant is an artifact believed to be the physical manifestation of God's presence and supreme power. According to the Bible, the gold-encrusted wooden chest contains the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. In ancient times, the box was kept in the First Temple, a Jewish place of worship in Jerusalem. However, when the temple was destroyed in 587 BC by a Babylonian army, the Ark disappeared, and no one knows for sure what became of it. Since its disappearance, many people, both real and fictional, have looked for the box, and it famously inspired Steven Spielberg's blockbuster movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Some ancient reports say that the Ark made its way to Babylon, while others believe that the Ark was buried somewhere in Jerusalem, or that it was destroyed along with the first temple. However, Ethiopia claims that the Ark resides in the Church of Our Lady, Mary of Zion, an Ethiopian Orthodox, Tawahedo Church located in the town of Aksum, in northern Ethiopia, where it is closely guarded by a virgin monk who cannot leave the sacred grounds until his death. Despite these claims, the Covenant's ownership has not been verified, as apart from the monk, no one is allowed in the chamber where it allegedly resides. Most historians think that if it does still exist, the 3,000-year-old relic would be disintegrated by now. Of course, this is only speculation, and for many, the final fate of the Ark remains a fascinating, and perhaps unsolvable, ancient mystery. Where is Cleopatra's tomb? Cleopatra's tomb has been lost for over 2,000 years, and has long been a source of intrigue for archaeologists and the public. So where is the tomb of the last queen of Egypt? Cleopatra, the legendary Egyptian beauty who bore children from both Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, famously killed herself in 30 BC after being captured by Roman Emperor Octavian. According to ancient texts, she took her life by letting a venomous snake called an asp bite her. It is claimed she was buried with Mark Antony in a mausoleum described by the writer Plutarch as a lofty and beautiful monument located near a temple of the Egyptian goddess Isis. But exactly where that is, is shrouded in mystery. For the past 15 years, a team led by Catherine Martinez has been excavating a site called Tapasirius Magna, located about 31 miles west of Alexandria. And although they have unearthed valuable ancient artifacts and coins minted during Cleopatra's reign, there is still no sign of her last resting place. However, despite the persistence of Martinez and her team, most archaeologists think that it's unlikely Cleopatra is buried there, with many believing her tomb was likely built next to her palace in Alexandria, in an area that is now underwater. Even if the tomb is not underwater, there is a good chance that it was either destroyed, robbed, or buried beneath modern-day Alexandria. There is no plans in place to search for a tomb underwater, although past projects have looked at Cleopatra's palace and found nothing, and it's feared the enduring mystery of Cleopatra's tomb may never be solved. Maybe there is a young archaeologist out there now who will make it their life mission to find the tomb. How will life on Earth end? Life is fragile, but also remarkably resilient. And according to scientists, the first living things appeared as far back as 4 billion years ago, at a time when colossal space rocks were still pounding Earth. Throughout its history, Earth has experienced all manner of catastrophes, from supernova blasts and asteroid strikes, to huge volcanic eruptions and sudden climate shifts, all of which have killed off various life forms. Despite this, life has always recovered, creating new species and evolving to every situation. So what exactly would it take to kill off all life forms on Earth forever? Well, an asteroid would do a good job of that. And we came close 66 million years ago, when a city-sized asteroid struck Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs and other species. Without that strike, dinosaurs would likely still rule the world. An equivalent event now would almost certainly wipe out humanity and many other life forms. But the good news is, 
that if it does happen, it will not be for at least another 100 million years, according to NASA. Next up is deoxygenation, which is a more likely cause of life extinction. Around 2.5 billion years ago, a period called the Great Oxidization Event provided us with the breathable atmosphere we all now depend on. But when a sweeping climate change left the supercontinent covered with glaciers, it wasn't just the cold that killed off species, it was the plummeting oxygen levels. Researchers believe that the ice was responsible for changing the layers of the oceans and the concentrations of elements like oxygen. According to some estimates, more than 80% of life on Earth died during the late Ordovician mass extinction. In a worrying comparison to today, researchers claim that the change in the climate is already reducing oxygen levels in our oceans, potentially killing off marine species. So is it only a matter of time before the oxygen levels get too low to sustain human life here on Earth? What do you think? Next up is a gamma ray burst. Over the years, researchers have theorized that what sparked the global cooling of the late Ordovician mass extinction could have been a gamma ray burst, or GRB for short. GRBs are unexplained violent energetic explosions in the cosmos that astronomers suspect are linked to extreme supernova. To date, we haven't yet seen a burst close enough to Earth to fully comprehend what's going on. And so far, GRBs have only been spotted in other galaxies. However, if one did happen in the Milky Way, it could potentially cause a mass extinction here on Earth. And lastly, we have the aging of the Sun. Perhaps the most likely and devastating scenario of how life on Earth will end. In about a billion years from now, as the Sun gets older and puts out more energy, eventually Earth will reach a point where atmospheric carbon dioxide breaks down and plants and organisms that need photosynthesis to survive will die. Without the life forms that help to sustain the oxygen-rich atmosphere we require to live, humans and other animals will be unable to survive. Researchers are sure that this will happen eventually, but the good news is, we still have about a billion years to prepare for it. House Fire Ghost an abandoned, dilapidated house in an unknown location had been deliberately set alight by the fire department in a controlled manner. Spectators gathered to watch the burning and took some photos. However, after looking over the images later, one of the photographers got a shock. Take a look. It looks like a mother and her child are fleeing the fire, even though neither were witnessed by the spectators at the scene. The chilling shot made people speculate that it was the spirit of a former resident of the long-abandoned home. What do you think? Serial Killer in a Jar Diego Alves was a Spanish serial killer and robber who between 1836 and 1840 murdered at least 70 people near Lisbon in Portugal. On the 19th of February 1841, Alves was hanged for his crimes. His heinous actions intrigued scientists as they wanted to study his brain so his head was severed from his corpse and preserved in a jar of formaldehyde solution. Over 180 years later, it is still in a jar, perfectly preserved, and not showing any signs that it has been studied. The severed head is currently in the anatomical theater of the University of Lisbon's Faculty of Medicine, and at times has been put on public display. Upside Down Nature these creepy looking faces left Instagram users perplexed when they were released recently. The faces are reminiscent of the Joker from Batman or some other demonic character from a horror film. However, the truth behind the shot is actually quite simple to explain. It's a photo of the underbelly of a perfectly normal great white shark, which has been flipped upside down. The shift in perspective makes one of the world's most well-known creatures look even more sinister. Ghostly Installation St. George's Church in the small village of Lakova in the Czech Republic was built in 1352, and since the roof collapsed during a funeral in 1968, it has been largely abandoned by the living, as the locals believe the place is cursed and haunted. 
However, in 2012, a resident decided to raise funds to repair the church, and together with a local art student, came up with a novel but rather creepy way to raise the money. The artist created plaster models of parishioners who had passed away, then covered them with white sheets before placing them randomly in the pews of the church. The ghostly and quite morbid installation has attracted visitors from all over the world and has raised enough money to get the roof repaired and keep the church going. Woodland Horror If you are taking a leisurely walk through the woods and you came across swollen looking blackened fingers poking up through the earth, your first thought would be that you have stumbled across a grave, or worse, someone buried alive who had tried to escape. In reality, these are aptly named Dead Man's Fingers, a macabre looking saprobic fungus that is fairly common in the United Kingdom, Ireland, mainland Europe and parts of North America. So look out for them next time you're on a woodland walk. Above and Beyond This poignant image is a reminder of the cost of war. What you're seeing is 58,307 dog tags. Each tag represents a person killed in the Vietnam War, showing their name, military branch and date of death. The art installation was commissioned by the National Veterans Art Museum and created by artist Rick Steinbock and veteran artists Ned Broderick, Joe Fornelli and Mike Halbing and is the only memorial other than the wall in Washington DC to list all those killed in action during the Vietnam War. It certainly gives pause for thought. The Mad Bomber. This cheerful looking guy posing with his wide smile looks harmless enough, until you realize this is George Metesky, better known as the Mad Bomber, who terrorized New York City for 16 years in the 1940s and 50s by planting bombs in various public places. In total, at least 33 bombs were placed, of which 22 exploded, injuring 15 people. His reason for creating such carnage was that he was angry and resentful about events surrounding a workplace injury he'd suffered years earlier. Metzky was apprehended in 1957 based on clues given in letters he wrote to a newspaper and was found legally insane and committed to a state mental hospital. He was released in 1973 and died 20 years later at the age of 90. The Sadness of Otto Frank Anne Frank was a German-born Jew living with her family in Frankfurt during Hitler's regime. His hatred of the Jews forced the family to move to Amsterdam and start a new life. On the 1st of September 1939, when Anne was just 10 years old, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, and the Second World War began. Just a few days later, they invaded the Netherlands. Life became unbearable for Jews living there, so Anne's father Otto moved the family to a cramped hiding place in the attic of his business premises in Prinzengraf 263. Anne and her family had to keep very quiet and were often afraid during the two years they spent in the attic, but Anne occupied her time by documenting every single day of her life there. Eventually the family were discovered by the Nazis and Anne and her family were transported to the Auschwitz concentration and extermination camp. Anne and her sister were later moved to Bergen-Belsen, where sadly they both died of typhus. However, remarkably her diary survived, and after the war, her father, who was the only member of the family to survive, introduced Anne's writings to people all over the world, and in 1960, the hiding place in Amsterdam became a museum, the Anne Frank House. This poignant photo shows Otto revisiting the tiny space for the first time since losing all of his family. What must have been going through his mind? Forced Standing Mental health treatments have come a long way since the 1800s, when patients were subjected to inhumane treatments such as shock therapy, lobotomies and other torturous therapy. Sadly, for the lady in our next image, such treatment was rife, and we see her manacled and facing a wall in Germany in what was known as standing therapy. Take a look at this appalling treatment. Would you dare? There's not a whole lot of information on this next clip, but we found it pretty creepy, just looking down into the dark abyss. The Beast of Jersey 
Edward Paisnell was a serial sex offender who terrorised the Channel Islands of Jersey between 1957 and 1971. He entered homes at night dressed in a rubber mask and nail studded wristlets, attacking women and children. On July 17, 1971, Paisnell was stopped by police after running a red light. In the boot of his stolen car, they discovered his attack kit that included the horrific mask. He was later convicted on 13 counts of sexual and physical assault and sentenced to 30 years in prison. After his imprisonment, his wife wrote the book, The Beast of Jersey, that featured a police photo of her husband wearing the horrific mask. Ed Gein's Trophies Of all the serial killers we've talked about in the past, we've always found Ed Gein to be the most interesting case. We've talked about Ed many times before, but it's easy to forget the horrors that were found in his house. He was not the most prolific serial killer ever, but was probably the most shocking. His crimes committed around his hometown of Plainfield, Wisconsin, were some of the most abhorrent ever recorded. Gein dug up bodies from local graveyards and also murdered two local women, but it was what he did with their remains that was so grotesque. He used their body parts to fashion trophies and keepsakes, using their bones and skin. He made everyday items like belts, clothing and household goods, and adorned his squalid home with them. Here are some mock-ups of just a few of the grotesque things he made. There are many others that are even more horrific, and many details were never made available to the public. After his arrest, Gein was found unfit for trial and confined to a mental health facility. He eventually stood trial, but was found legally insane. He died at Mendota Mental Health Institute from lung cancer on July 26, 1984, age 77. Going to work. This next photo will make you think twice about moaning about work conditions. It shows what miners had to endure on a daily basis. This was a mine in Belgium, but similar conditions were seen in mines around the world during the 1900s. In this instance, the miners were being brought up from the coal face at the end of their shift, only to endure the exact same thing the next day. Mining in general is incredibly interesting and there are lots of creepy stories and horrific incidents to be told about the mining days. So let us know if you'd like to see a video on that. The Last Portrait In December 1929, Charlie Lawson treated his wife Fanny and their seven young children to a shopping trip to buy new clothes in preparation for a family portrait he had arranged as a Christmas present. It was unusual for a working class rural family to go to such expense and the children must have been surprised and excited by their father's generosity. This portrait was taken just before Christmas. On Christmas day of the same year, Charlie Lawson slaughtered his entire family. First he shot two of his daughters before savagely beating them to ensure they were dead. Then he shot his wife and three of his other children before killing the baby. After the senseless murders, he went into a nearby woods and shot himself. The only survivor was his eldest son, 19-year-old Arthur, whom Charlie had sent on an errand just before committing the crime. A truly horrifying story. Floating Child This piece of footage was captured in a home in Japan. We're not sure when or exactly where, but it appears to show a child floating through the house. Take a look. It looks like it was filmed on a homeowner's CCTV. However, the homeowner was not as spooked as you may think, as he believes it was a Zashiki Warashi, a famed character from Japanese folklore and was thrilled that the apparition had visited him, as this creature is not a creature of terror, but rather a childlike ghost who likes to play pranks, and once it inhibits your property, the homeowner will enjoy good fortune. What do you make of it? Farmhouse Ghost 
The next one we're going to take a look at is a photograph, which was found in an old album by the owner of a Welsh file house. The image shows the outside of his home, however he was shocked when he noticed a creepy looking face peering out from one of the windows. Can you see it? The homeowner posted the photo on social media to get a second opinion on what he was seeing, and many agreed something strange was going on. The house, located on the outskirts of Almlick on Anglesey, was built in 1923 in the aftermath of World War I, and has passed through the generations down to the current owner. But the building has seen its fair share of tragedy. The current owner's great-grandmother died just six weeks after moving into the then newly built family home. Then the following year, a 14-week-old baby boy passed away in the house, followed by the now owner's grandfather and mother. Over the years, there have been some unexplained incidents in the house, with lights turning off by themselves, and the family dog being spooked by an unseen presence. The owner believes the figure in the window could be his mother, as in life she had long black hair, similar to the person in the window. Route 87 Ghost A truck driver got the shock of his life whilst driving on Arizona State Route 87 when he noticed a figure standing motionless on the roadside. He later checked his dashcam footage and it had captured this. The driver said there were no other vehicles in sight and described the glare that appears at the side of the road as resembling a standing human figure. What would you do if you were driving along the road and saw this? Would you stop and take a look or carry on going? Scalene Seminary Monk Scalene Seminary in the Scottish Highlands was once used as a refuge for Catholic monks. So when this photograph was taken, showing what appears to be a hooded figure standing in the window, many believed one of the monks had returned in death. Although there is no record of anyone dying violently at the now abandoned seminary in the Scottish Highlands, a teacher called John Patterson died there of natural causes in 1783. He was allegedly so tall he needed a long coffin that would not fit through the low door and into the narrow corridor and the steep staircase. Could this be the spirit of John Patterson making his presence known through the window of the building? A case of pareidolia or a prank. What do you think? Tudor Apparition Hampton Court Palace was built in 1525 on the banks of the River Thames, just outside of central London. Famously designed by Henry VIII, it is the scene of many dramatic events, including the death of Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour, during childbirth and the imprisonment of his fifth wife, Catherine Howard, before her execution at the Tower of London, and both King Charles I and Oliver Cromwell also have an association with the building. According to groundskeepers of the building, on three consecutive days in the winter of 2003, the palace security staff were called to close one particular door in the palace. On the first day of these reports, CCTV footage showed the doors flying open but there was nothing to reveal why. It was the second day that a ghostly apparition dressed in period clothing was caught on camera. Take a look. According to records, no one dressed in period clothing was in the building that day, and one visitor wrote in the palace's visitor book on the day this footage was caught, that she had seen a ghost in that particular area. The figure in the video became known as the Skeletor, and despite numerous investigations, this case has never been solved. Decibel Hotel Ghost The Decibel Hotel, formerly known as Franz Iosif Hotel, was built in 1865 in the spa town of Bailey Herculane in Romania. The abandoned hotel has the reputation of being haunted and attracts ghost hunters from around the world. Local legend says that beneath the foundations of the hotel is Roman hidden treasure and a woman's spirit keeps guard of the building to stop treasure hunters from stealing it. 
while the following photograph was taken in 2008 by a tourist, and it seems to confirm that there is a spirit present in the building. This is not the first time the female apparition has been witnessed on the staircase, but is the first time a clear image was caught on camera. The photographer didn't realize until she got home and looked at the photos she had taken. It was then that she noticed what appears to be the shadow of a woman dressed in long white clothes. What do you think? Freemasons On January 22nd, 1985, the Coventry Freemason Organization had a dinner event at St. Mary's Guildhall in Coventry in the United Kingdom. The group were photographed as they bowed their heads in prayer at the start of their meal. However, when this photograph was developed, a mysterious towering figure appeared in the image who was not present at the dinner and appeared to be wearing clothes from another era that resembled a monk's frock. Built around 1340, the historic St. Mary's Guildhall is one of the only remaining medieval buildings in the city and is home to the magnificent Coventry Tapestry, which provides a glimpse into the Coventry's fascinating history and has links to King Henry V, VI and VII, and Mary Queen of Scots. She is reportedly one of the many ghostly apparitions said to have been witnessed in the building over the centuries. However, the most persistent sighting is that of a ghostly monk, and it's thought his presence was captured again in 2014, when Irish President Michael Higgins gave a speech at the Guildhall, and was photographed by a local newspaper who captured a strange floating emerald mass behind the president. Is this a trick of the light, or was the monk from the 1985 Freemasons meeting captured once again near the tapestry? Farm Boy This photograph was taken at a farm in Herefordshire, England in 2008 by photographer and graphic designer Neil Sandback. It was to be used on a wedding invite for his friend's upcoming wedding, and at first glance it looks innocent enough. However, when Neil later opened the file in Photoshop to tidy it up, he noticed a white figure in the distance on the right. When zooming in, this is what he saw. Initially, he didn't think it was anything supernatural, but after the wedding, couples asked staff at the venue if the place was haunted. They told them that for years, they'd been plagued by the spooky apparition of the ghost of a young boy dressed in white nightclothes, who was always spotted close to the main barn. Now, take that as you will, but we think that is pretty damn convincing and scary. The Balmeth Faces Since 1971, the Pereira family in Balmeth, Spain, have been troubled by creepy stains repeatedly appearing on their kitchen floor. Known as the Balmeth Faces, the family claims that the strange images keep emerging despite efforts to wash them away. The stains manifest as creepy faces with both male and female features of different shapes and sizes, and one face can morph into another. When the first face appeared, the then owner of the house, Maria Gomez Camara, was so disturbed that her husband smashed up the flooring with an axe in a bid to rid the home of the unwanted markings. But as the surface dried, a new ghastly face soon appeared. Take a look at some of the images that have manifested over the last 40 years. The faces caused such a stir in the tiny town of Balmath that it prompted the mayor to forbid any further destruction of the stains, ordering that they should be preserved for research. The site soon became a tourist attraction and in 1972, hundreds of people visited the House of the Faces. Paranormal experts got involved and believed the house was built on the site of a 17th century murder and was close to an ancient cemetery, and that the Faces could be paranormal in nature. The more cynical believed that it was all a hoax, with the family profiting from the money generated from tourists. The phenomenon was so widely publicized that meticulous research into the concrete and its patterns was conducted right up until Maria died, aged 85 in 2004. However, in a creepy twist, 
the faces continue to appear after her death, dismissing the theory that Maria was responsible for them. A technical analysis on the faces concluded that the images were not made with paint, and that there was no external manipulation or elements in the faces. Efforts to recreate them using concrete solvents, hydrochloric acid, and silver nitrate were unsuccessful. To this very day, there is no scientific explanation for the unnerving faces, and the case remains a mystery to this day. What do you think? Soul Leaving the Body Our last entry in this video may give you some comfort that our souls leave our body and head to another world. This video allegedly shows the moment a man's soul leaves his body after he drowned in a river. The footage was shot on a phone by Chanel on November 21st, 2020 in the Philippines. Take a look. The man reportedly drowned at the quarry site while trying to save a stray dog. He was able to save the animal and push it to safety, but in doing so, he slipped into a deeper part of the river. As rescuers tried to save him, onlookers witnessed the white spirit emerge from the water, and he was not saved. Some believe it could just be someone smoking to the left of the person filming, while others believe this is proof that our spirits leave our body upon death. What do you think? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Grey Lady of Cumber Park Cumber Park in Nottinghamshire has long had the reputation of being haunted by a grey lady who walks slowly and disappears into the mist as strangers approach. The National Trust owned park is very popular with dog walkers and when Hannah and Dave Rowett were walking their Labradors in the park early one morning in December 2022, they got the feeling they were not alone. Hannah spotted something in front of her, quickly pulled out her phone and captured a scary white silhouette crossing her path as she followed it with a torch. Take a look. After Hannah posted it to her Facebook page, it racked up hundreds of views and comments. Hannah claimed there was no logical explanation for what she captured, and even her skeptic partner Dave was stunned. Could that have been the grey lady that supposedly haunts the woodland, or is there another explanation? Let us know below. Chop Chop House in Boise, Idaho 805 West Linden Street in Boise, Idaho is known to locals as Chop Chop House for a very good reason. The craftsman-style home was the location of a gruesome murder more than three decades ago. In the early morning hours of June 30th, 1987, 37-year-old Daniel Rogers and 31-year-old Darren Cox shot and killed 21-year-old Preston Murr in the basement of the Boise house that at the time was owned by Rogers. The two men then used an axe and knife to dismember Murr's corpse. They then wrapped the body parts in plastic bags and drove to the Idaho-Oregon border to dump them in the Brownlee Reservoir. However, it seems that Murr's horrifying death could have been avoided. Investigations revealed that after an altercation broke out between the three men, Murr was shot in the shoulder but he managed to flee the scene and ran to a nearby house, frantically banging on the door, begging for help. The person inside didn't answer the door, but they did call the police and told them about the pounding on the door, and that they could hear someone shouting, let go of me, followed by anguished screams. The police never responded to the call. The following day, the neighbor called again after finding blood on his screen door. When police finally arrived, they found blood throughout the neighborhood on sidewalks and at least one other neighboring house. As Paul Murs desperately tried to seek help and escape his attackers. Rogers and Cox were eventually jailed for their parts in the slaying, but since that night, a dark legacy lingers around 805 W Linden Street. Today the house is rented out to students seeking off-campus housing, but rumors persist about what goes on in the house that many describe as having a distinctly off feel about it. One persistent rumor is that blood has been witnessed dripping down the walls of the basement. The basement is where all the paranormal activity is felt, with stories of being watched 
and a general unsettling feeling. But perhaps the creepiest experience happened to student Dan and his friends who had rented the house. One night they thought they'd heard someone trying to break into the house. No one was there when they went to the front porch to check things out, but after looking around the front yard, Dan turned to face the house and saw a big black oily looking thing in the window of an upstairs bedroom. He remembers the shadowy figure moving back from the window and towards the bedroom door before it disappeared. Shortly after, it reappeared outside in a mirror on the porch. Dan watched as the ball of oily blackness moved down the large column of the porch, slowly growing in size until it took up the full reflection of the mirror and moved right through him. The vivid and unsettling experience has given the house such a bad reputation that many avoid it, believing the oily blob is the desperate spirit of Preston Murr still trying to escape his assailants. Last Sight of a Departed Friend This next true paranormal experience happened to Margaret S. Gladstone from Wiltshire, England, who wrote to Country Life magazine on September 24th, 1948. Margaret was prompted to write by some recent letters, which had appeared in the magazine in previous weeks. Margaret recalled returning to her flat in Westminster, London one afternoon when she saw two friends coming towards her on the other side of the street. She was in a rush and running late, and although they were dear friends, she had no time to stop and hoped they would not notice her. Margaret deliberately crossed the street, walking behind them, and successfully avoided their gaze. At breakfast time the next day, a mutual friend rang to tell Margaret that the man she had seen the day before had passed away in the night. Margaret was shocked and told the friend that she had seen him and his wife the day before, and they appeared in full health. Her friend then exclaimed that this was an impossibility, as he had been ill for some days, and had been bedbound. So was he trying to say a last goodbye, or was it a case of mistaken identity? Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and if you've ever experienced something like this. Lizzie Borden House Most people know the story of Lizzie Borden, the daughter who on August 4th, 1893, allegedly brutally murdered both her parents in their home in Fall Rivers, Massachusetts. Andrew and his wife, Abby Borden, were found slaughtered in their home. Although murder wasn't uncommon in the late 1800s, the severity of their injuries inflicted by an axe shocked the locals, and soon their 32-year-old daughter Lizzie became the main suspect. The crime and trial made headlines around the world. However, Lizzie was eventually acquitted of murder, but she remains forever linked to the heinous killings as does the home where they were committed. Nowadays, the house is a bed and breakfast and attracts visitors from around the world who are drawn by morbid curiosity and want to see for themselves if the place lives up to its reputation of being haunted. One of the tour guides at the house tells how when she started working there, she was skeptic and didn't believe in the paranormal. That was until she started experiencing a few strange things herself. Guests had long reported that they could hear laughing and playing in the middle of the night and things moving around. The guy didn't believe them until she found toys scattered around a room no one had been in and witnessed a picture fall over and slide in front of her without a plausible explanation and a closet door open on its own. Also on the eve of the anniversary of Andrew and Abby's murder, she and two other tour guides felt sudden sharp piercing pains in their left eye in the exact location of Andrew Borden's fatal injuries. But perhaps the creepiest thing of all happened when the guide asked a tour group to turn their cell phones to silent before starting a tour. Moments later, a guest's cell phone started ringing. The female guest looked up and said, it's my mum. The tour guide asked if she wanted to leave and take the call, to which the woman replied, she died two years ago. Who's that girl? In 2022, brothers Christian and Gabriel Ashmore took a selfie of themselves inside a Tower of Tires. However, after looking more closely at one of the images, they realized they were not alone in the stack because looking over their shoulder was the ghostly image of a young girl they didn't recognize. Christian told his mum and showed her the photo and initially she thought the boys had messed with the image using some kind of ghost app so she did a couple of checks to see if she could change the lighting. 
or see whether the photo had been altered in any way, but couldn't find any evidence of this, and believed her boys didn't have the skills to change the photo anyway, and they were adamant they had not edited it in any way. In fact, Christian was apparently left so terrified by the ghost girl that he refused to go to bed alone and stayed in his mum's room. After sharing the photo with family and friends on Facebook, many believed the boys had captured the spirit of a deceased child who just wanted to play, whilst others were more sceptical, believing the photo is tampered with. What do you think? When the ghost you're hunting hunts you, the Ohio State Reformatory in Mansfield, Ohio is best known as the location of the Shawshank Redemption movie. However, it also boasts a rather unpleasant history. It was originally built in 1896 for boys who were too old for juvenile detention but hadn't committed crimes warranting prison. Although eventually it was converted into a maximum security prison. By the 1980s, conditions had become wretched and it was a horrible place with a vein of violence that ran right through the building. It was the scene of several suicides, murders and riots, and eventually it was closed in 1990. With its history of misery and death, it is no surprise that the building is haunted not only by former inmates and employees, but by anyone associated with them, including women. One is the tormented soul of the wife of a former warden who was shot with a gun sitting on top of a box that she was pulling down from a closet shelf. The anguished woman is often heard crying and her rose smelling perfume wafts in one of the bedrooms. Another spirit is a woman who sits in the prison chapel and cries, but when she is approached, she disappears. Other people have witnessed her walking around the chapel. Then there's the malevolent presence in one of the prison's solitary confinement cells, an angry spirit who wards off ghost hunters and visitors, warning them not to enter his cell. He has been caught on tape swearing. The former prisoner has also been known to follow people home, and one ghost hunter and her partner had a terrifying experience when he latched on to one of them. One day, one of them saw him through a reflection in the window, a shadow figure she knew was him. In fact, the spirit continued to follow her until things got so bad, an expert had to be called in to rid her of the ghost. A scary tale of when ghost hunting can go wrong and the reality of what happens when you go looking for the wrong things. So that's it for this video. We hope you enjoyed, and we'd love to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments section below. We'd also love to hear if you've had any of your own stories or experiences with the paranormal lately. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.